Good morning, and thank you for joining Mayor Brown's Global Financial Markets Teleconference Series. Today's call is entitled, Emerging Issues in the Buy Now, Pay Later Industry. My name is Libby Raymond, and I'm delighted to serve as the moderator. I am an M&A partner and co-head of the Financial Institutions M&A and FinTech groups at Mayor Brown. My practice focuses on M&A for financial institutions at the intersection of technology, regulation, and financial products. First, a couple housekeeping items. As regular listeners will know, this call is being recorded. We will be emailing an audio link to all participants should you wish to listen to the teleconference again or forward it to your colleagues. In addition, the recording will be available by podcast. Since we will not have a Q&A session, please send your questions regarding today's topic by email to gfm at mayorbrown.com and we will respond promptly. This is the same email address as on your invitation email. Joining me today are Mayor Brown partners, Steve Kaplan, Eric Mitzenmacher, and Amanda Baker. Steve Kaplan is a partner in Mayor Brown's Washington, D.C. office and co-leader for the firm's Financial Services Regulatory and Enforcement Group. Steve has extensive experience counseling financial institutions on the regulatory aspects of their investment in fintech businesses. Eric Mitzenmacher is also a partner in our Washington, D.C. office and a member of the firm's FISRI group. His practice involves providing regulatory compliance advice to companies that offer various consumer and small business financial products and services, as well as conducting regulatory due diligence reviews on behalf of investors in and financing sources for such companies. Amanda Baker is a structured finance partner in Mayor Brown's New York office, representing fintechs in various stages of their business, ranging from startup to establish companies issuing into the capital markets. Amanda also represents hedge funds and banks that provide financing to fintechs. With that introduction, let's begin today's discussion. 2021 has seen an explosion of interest in buy now, pay later companies, including large VC funding rounds, bank fintech partnerships, and M&A transactions. Noteworthy deals include Square's $29 billion acquisition of Afterpay, announced in August, and Goldman Sachs's $2 billion acquisition of GreenSky, announced in September. But not all buy now, pay later solutions are the same. Eric, can you begin by describing the types of buy now, pay later products we are seeing and what regulatory issues they raise? As Libby suggests, the BNPL space is diverse. It is also rapidly evolving, both through product iteration by larger incumbents and the introduction of new structures by startup competitors. One common theme that cuts across the space, however, is that regulatory considerations are critical in determining the set of viable products and the value of any particular product. We will move on to a discussion of particular regulatory considerations shortly. Before getting there, we need to set some groundwork. Most importantly, what is a BNPL product, at least for the purposes of this discussion? And how do BNPL products work from both the consumer and provider perspectives? In a broad sense, BNPL products are exactly what the name suggests, financial products that permit buyers to purchase goods or obtain the benefit of services now in exchange for making one or more deferred payments later. The diversity of the space means that we will not be talking about a single product structure, but there are identifiable dimensions across which BNPL products regularly break down. To the extent that there is a typical BNPL product at this time, the product involves an extension of credit repayable in not more than four deferred installments without traditional periodic interest or origination fees. Most BNPL products currently in market are variations on that theme. Key distinctions across products, however, include first, who extends credit, which may be the initial merchant, the BNPL provider, or a bank with which the BNPL provider has partnered. 
Second, whether there is a revolving or quasi-open-end account structure that consumers may access to make purchases from time to time. Third, whether transactions occur only online or also through in-store offerings, and if so, how in-store transactions are processed. Fourth, whether the product is a standalone credit product or a closed-end feature of a traditional credit card. And of course, fifth, how BNPL providers monetize their products and services through non-interest fees. As we walk through the regulatory environment, we will discuss how these factors may affect compliance obligations for the BNPL provider or other participants. We offer a few additional caveats to frame our regulatory discussion before we move forward. First, despite the potential breadth of the BNPL space, when using that term, we normally mean a set of products that are not traditional credit card purchases or longer-term interest-bearing installment or term loans. Those products certainly exist in the market and are ways for a buyer to make purchases today with deferred payment, but they normally are treated as distinct submarkets. They have a regulatory footprint that requires consideration of a variety of federal and state issues in order to assess risk, but regulatory analysis for these more traditional products is relatively mature, such that one would expect to spend more time considering whether a particular company is complying with a reasonably well-defined set of requirements than addressing questions of how the product is regulated in the first place. Similarly, the financing and secondary market approaches for such products is relatively well established. Note, however, that while traditional consumer credit programs compete with BNPL products, they can also be complementary, with an increasing number of BNPL providers offering them alongside credit card or term loan offerings or referrals to traditional lenders. Second, for the purposes of this discussion, our regulatory coverage will be focused on U.S., federal, and state considerations. The NPL products are also thriving outside of the U.S., including in Australia and Europe. And, as one might expect, local regulatory regimes play significant roles in how BNPL products are structured and how BNPL providers engage with consumers and commercial counterparties. Finally, for the purposes of this discussion, our focus will be on consumer programs, which represent the core of the BNPL space in the U.S. Small business and commercial BNPL programs or other purchase financing programs exist, but the regulatory issues affecting product structure are distinct and typically more limited. With that groundwork laid, we can move on to a discussion of how BNPL products are regulated in the U.S. and how BNPL providers financing sources, and secondary market participants might begin to assess and control regulatory risks. To begin that discussion, I'll hand the mic over to Steve Kaplan. Thank you, Eric. Like most other consumer financial products and services in the United States, BNPL products are subject to potential regulation at both the federal and state levels. As an initial scoping matter, Buy now, pay later products typically will involve credit under a broad conception of that term that includes the ability to incur debt or to purchase a good or service and defer the payment therefore. Accordingly, BNPL products will be subject to at least some credit regulatory requirements. Individual laws or regulatory regimes, however, may define narrower scopes of regulated conduct. Accordingly, which set of requirements applies to a particular BNPL product depends in large part on the specific structure of the product and the overall program. In general, federal statutes and regulations are sources for disclosure and practice restrictions, whereas state statutes and regulations include not only those elements, but also licensing and approval requirements that provide BNPL providers and other program participants the basic authority to conduct their consumer financial activities. In some cases, the application of the law is uncertain, and the best way to reduce regulatory burden is to work to the lowest common denominator or to vary practices in different jurisdictions if that's technologically possible. At the federal level, key scoping issues largely relate to the core consumer-facing aspects of the BNPL product, including the structure of the repayment obligation and any fees that may be paid by the consumer, 
as well as the specific origination and servicing practices used by the BNPL provider. To be certain, certain elements of program structure, such as identity of the creditor, may be relevant in some cases. For example, programs implemented through a bank partnership may be subject to formal anti-money laundering program and customer identification program requirements under the Bank Secrecy Act that would not apply in a typical non-bank program. Generally, however, consumer-facing aspects will predominate when considering the efforts of the federal consumer financial regulatory environment on BNPL programs. The most significant set of federal requirements that we see affecting BNPL products tend to be those under the Truth in Lending Act, or TILA. TILA imposes disclosure and practice requirements on certain persons offering certain types of consumer credit. For non-credit card products, most TILA requirements apply to a set of creditors that offers consumer credit that is repayable by a written agreement in more than four installments or bears a finance charge, such as interest or certain fees, including origination fees. If a party is a creditor, one must look to the specific type of credit extended to determine the particular disclosure and practice requirements. Different requirements apply to closed end and open credit, for example. Requirements also vary for mortgages and private student loans, but those are beyond the scope of this discussion at this time. While TILA requirements for non-credit card products are not necessarily prescriptive in a way that would prevent products from being offered in the first place, they impose operational burdens that many BNPL providers seek to avoid. Accordingly, Many BNPL products are designed to be repayable and not more than four installments, as Eric said, and understanding how any particular fees or other charges associated with the BNPL product are not finance charges frequently becomes a critical element of federal regulatory compliance for program design and diligence purposes. The question of whether certain fees are finance charges is one we frequently spend a significant amount of time discussing with clients. TILA also imposes requirements on credit accessible by credit cards, including credit that may be repayable in four or fewer installments or may not have a finance charge. For TILA purposes, credit cards include not only traditional plastic, but also other devices that permit a consumer to access credit from time to time to make purchase. Mirror account numbers are exempt through regulatory commentary, provided they do not access an open-end line of credit. Both as a result of the account number commentary and because TILA's provisions related to open-end credit, i.e. the CARD Act, are more substantively burdensome, careful consideration of whether a given BNPL product involves open-end credit or otherwise involves a credit card is critical to TILA compliance. For the purpose of TILA, open-end credit includes credit products contemplating repeated transactions with a revolving credit limit under which the creditor may impose a finance charge from time to time on an outstanding unpaid balance, and closed-end credit is defined in the negative to be all other extensions of credit. Certain other consumer financial laws and regulations have exemptions or partial exemptions for BNPL-like structures. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act, or ECOA, for example, imposes anti-discrimination requirements for credit programs that includes a partial exemption primarily from procedural requirements such as adverse action requirements and certain limited restrictions on the acquisition or use of information and credit origination processes for non-credit card products repayable in not more than four deferred installments with no finance charge. Similarly, the Military Lending Act, which imposes a variety of contracting, disclosure, and practice requirements and creditors extending credit to active duty service members excludes coverage of credit repayable in not more than four deferred installments without a finance charge. Many BNPL programs are structured such that they fall into these exclusions. Failing to do so is not inherently a violation of law, but would require additional compliance controls such that careful assessment, again, particularly on whether any fees or charges are finance charges, frequently is warranted to ensure that compliance risks for a given BNPL product are scoped appropriately. Remaining federal compliance obligations may apply to a BNPL program based on practices, but are not particularly distinct in application to BNPL products versus the more traditional consumer credit products. These may include, but are not necessarily limited to, payment authorization and prohibitions on compulsory use 
of reoccurring ACH pay payments under the Electronic Fund Transfer Act, privacy and information security under requirements under the Graham Leach Wiley Act, and requirements relating to obtaining, using, and furnishing information in connection with credit reports under the Fair Credit Re Reporting Act. BNTL programs are also subject to a general prohibition on unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices, referred to as UDAPs under federal law. While that is true of all consumer credit product aspects of BNTL products that warrant particularly careful consideration include oversight of merchants, particularly if merchants provide an active role in product solicitation or application processing, and the disclosure of material terms of credit, particularly where form disclosure requirements under TILA may not or clearly do not apply. Although this all seems straightforward, there are many nuances. For example, as noted before, is a fee a finance charge? A late fee should not trigger TILA requirements, for example. Multiple late fees also should not trigger um, TILA requirements, but they may trigger other state requirements or UDAP, raise UDAP concerns. With that, I'll turn it over to Eric to discuss state regulatory requirements. Thank you, Steve. Moving from the federal level to the state level introduces new categories of regulatory requirements. In addition to disclosure and practice requirements that may mirror or supplement federal law, state law typically is the source of BMPL providers' authority to offer their programs in the first place. That authority can arise from different sets of state laws, or state laws can apply in fundamentally different ways, depending on how the product and program are structured. Some of the relevant considerations are similar to those at the federal level, such as the number of installments or the nature and amount of fees or other charges. Other considerations are based on the mere identity of the creditor. BNPL products typically are structured in one of three ways. First, through the extension of credit by a non-bank BNPL provider itself. Second, through the extension of credit by the merchant, after which a BNPL provider may acquire the credit agreement or receivables, or merely service the credit agreement on a post-origination basis. Or third, through the extension of credit by a bank operating in partnership with the BNPL provider, which then may acquire an interest in or merely service the credit agreement. In the first model, in which there is non-bank BNPL provider originated credit, the program normally will be regulated by state lender licensing and regulatory laws, unless exempt based on product terms. Unlike in the next two models, in which there might be questions about appropriate characterization of the creditor, that issue tends to be relatively straightforward when a BNPL provider merely acts as a lender. Accordingly, regulatory scoping for non-bank loan models tends to come down to product term issues, such as the number of installments, the interest rate or the rate or amount of other charges or consideration, or the loan size. In the second model, in which there is merchant-originated credit, the credit agreement is a retail installment sale, or credit sale, that typically will be regulated at the state level by a Retail Installment Sales Act, again, unless exempt based on product terms. These laws occasionally require a registration or notification to be filed by the merchant, but more frequently license only a party acquiring the credit agreement, typically known as a sales finance company. If these laws apply, they may include disclosure and practice limitations, though they tend to be somewhat less restrictive than laws governing third-party lenders. In most cases, the distinction between a credit sale and a loan is merely the identity of the original creditor, though we note that certain states have sought to recharacterize sales finance companies as lenders, where they are too active in operationalizing the origination process, and in particular, as seen in recent enforcement activity in California brought against a set of BNPL providers for unlicensed lending, where the product otherwise would be unregulated but for treatment as a loan. In the final model, in which there is bank-originated credit, the credit agreement once again will be a loan, but the BNPL provider will not be the lender, and issues relating to the permissibility of interest or other finance charges under state law will be mitigated by the bank's authority to, quote-unquote, export interest under federal banking law. That said, the BNPL provider may be subject to regulation as a loan broker or arranger, as a loan purchaser, 
and or as a loan servicer or collector, depending on its particular activities and the product terms. These models then raise their own unique issues related to the potential recharacterization of the BNPL provider as the true lender, and if there is interest or there are fees that may be treated as interest, the BNPL providers or other participants' ability to service loans at the contracted rates after loans are, served, are sold by the originating bank, the so-called Madden issue. Each of these requires detailed analysis and should be a key target in program design and, and diligence. With the regulatory framework set out, we now turn to Amanda Baker, who will comment on transaction structures and what we are seeing in the financing and secondary markets for BNPL providers and products. Thanks, Eric, and hello all. I'm Amanda Baker, as Libby introduced me at the start of today's discussion. I'll focus on the niche buy now, pay later space that has developed under, under the general FinTech umbrella as it has emerged in recent years and picked up steam as more people turn to online purchasing. This trend was likely bolstered by the global COVID pandemic, but was beginning to emerge already with Gen Z members. In the last few years, zero interest lending has spread widely thanks to fintech firms which now offer it for buying almost anything, ranging from lower ticket items such as sneakers to higher ticket items such as Peloton. They offer it online and in person and have made it convenient, quick, and seamless via an app, digitally, or in store. Stuck at home for months and forced to shop for everything online during the COVID lockdowns, consumers discovered they liked the convenience and affordability of buy now, pay later, and gained a stronger appreciation of debt management fueling more growth in this sector, particularly as buy now, pay later financing offers zero interest rates, as this cost is borne by the merchants seeking to raise their client exposure and profile. With the overall growth in the fintech sector broadly, as well as in the buy now, pay later space, we are seeing more participants coming into the market. The participant growth is threefold. First, new companies and larger companies due to M&A activity that Libby will discuss next making significant modifications to their businesses, partner banks trying to enter the space, and lastly, hedge funds and banks seeking to provide third-party financing or otherwise get in on the action. We've recently seen new companies entering the market, particularly with a niche buy now, pay later, point of sale offering or card-like products that compete with traditional credit card financing for consumers. There's also been a lot of big name M&A activity particularly with fintech giant Square announcing it would acquire Afterpay this summer. As fintech companies themselves have expanded and evolved, some of the smaller niche bank partners not previously in the space have also started to enter the market. It's my opinion that these banks view this as an opportunity to come in and work with a fintech in developing its platform, whereas some of the larger, more long-standing bank partners, such as the Cross River web banks of the world, have an established form and protocols and tend to have more bargaining power. I think it will be interesting to watch as this trend either continues to expand and perhaps shape the market, or if it will fail to gain traction as the larger established bank partners have been in the space for years and can bring both experience as well as reputation to the table. Finally, we are always seeing new banks and hedge funds entering the space to provide financing options to fintech seeking third-party funding. While we expect to continue to see a wide array of transactions coming out of the buy now, pay later space, ranging from whole loan sales to pass-through certificates, levered certificates, warehouses, co-sponsored transactions, and traditional capital markets transactions, industry participants are starting to see some developments around the edges. One such development is the addition of bringing in a BP lender into the transaction as part of the negotiation and the commitment letter and term sheet phase. In order to expand financing capacity and also the pool of funding partners, warehouse deals are now adding in this additional layer of financing. Negotiations with BP lenders generally follow the same trends as a traditional lender with a few nuances and areas where the A and BP lenders may not be aligned. The main areas for negotiation are typically tied to the cash flows and waterfall placement of the Class B lender's payments of principal and interest, as well as other amounts particularly whether interest will be paid after Class A interest or whether it will be paid further down the waterfall after the Class A principal. Whether the Class B lender can call any defaults or sit at the table when determining to exercise remedies are also often discussion points. We see Class B rights only coming in if there has been a bankruptcy at the borrower 
only for certain defaults that cannot be cured or sometimes we see the Class B lender having equal rights with the Class A's. Dovetailing with the post-default rates, negotiation around a buyout option for the Class B lenders in the event that the Class A lenders want to leave the facility, auction mechanics, and rights of first refusal are also negotiated features in a transaction with the BP lender or lenders. In addition to the changes to the warehouse funding structure, as many of the fintechs grow, become more sophisticated, and with some executing initial public offerings, they are seeking to renegotiate the terms of their whole loan flow transactions. Typically, when a company is first entering the third-party financing space, they will start with forms of flow documents that they provide to certain investors for negotiation. As the company evolves and gets more bargaining power, they often want to renegotiate these forms, particularly if there are substantial covenants and financial tests. Once a company has gone public, they should no longer need to comply with these requirements as this information is now publicly available. In addition to requiring renegotiation of the flow documents, these changes can sometimes have an impact on the warehouse that gets put on the back end of the transaction by the hedge fund purchasing the loan. If the company is no longer providing certain information, performing certain actions, or giving the same representation and indemnity packages to the hedge fund, then the fund is on the hook for the gap risk if it does not renegotiate its warehouse with its bank or banks. Finally, Madden-like risks are always a part of the discussion with banks and funds having different standards for whether or how they will finance these assets. As the transaction is going to be issued into the capital markets, it is important that all parties are on the same page with any regulatory disclosure, as this area is always evolving and will differ from state to state. In addition to traditional financing, we are starting to see some traditional banks enter the market with credit card-like products. While some banks might be worried that it's going to cannibalize credit card balances, the data suggests that it's more likely to add a new client segment into the mix, which will further continue to expand the buy now, pay later products. I'll now turn it over to Libby. Thanks, Amanda. As shown in the remarks by Eric, Steve, and Amanda, there is a lot to think about if you are considering investing in or buying a buy now, pay later business. I will cover due diligence, structural, and M&A contractual issues raised when considering an M&A deal involving a buy now, pay later. As we have discussed, due diligence of a buy now, pay later business should include a review of the material regulatory risks raised by the business as well as financing and other material contracts of the business. On the regulatory side, as Eric has shown, not all buy now, pay later products are the same. They are constantly evolving to suit merchant and customer preferences. In fact, buy now, pay later is just the latest online version of the type of point of sale lending business that banks and merchants have provided consumers for years. Buyers will want to carefully vet what products are being offered, how they are marketed by the merchant and buy now, pay later provider, how the buy now, pay later provider is licensed, and whether there have been any regulatory exams or investigations that remain open. Traditional point of sale lending risks, such as merchant fraud or mis-selling, remain important as shown by recent CFPB enforcement actions. Buyers should consider whether the terms of a buy now, pay later product create a loan or extension of credit that has not been properly sold by a licensed entity or that could violate TILA requirements. It is also important to review marketing materials and policies and procedures for product origination and servicing to ensure compliance. In diligencing the financing side, Buyers will want to see if there is a change in control provision providing for a lender consent or an event of default if the owner of the buy now, pay later is changed. Lender consents may not be an issue if the investment transaction demonstrates that the buy now, pay later has increased in value and is being purchased by a bigger, more creditworthy entity. On the other hand, the buyer may want to refinance the buy now, pay later's debt or may no longer need debt. Is the financing prepayable without a penalty? If term securitizations or other capital markets deals have been used to finance the buy now, pay later, the diligence issues may get more complex. It may not be possible to prepay a term deal unless the buyer is willing to do a consent solicitation. However, the buyer may be happy to let the term deal wind down on its own and not prepay it. 
the buy now, pay later as seller may need to obtain various consents and opinions to affect the change of control of the originator and servicer, but these are typically relatively easy to obtain or may not be necessary if the seller has flexible merger provisions. Technology diligence is also crucial in looking at a buy now, pay later, or really any fintech. Buyers need to confirm that the technology and infrastructure of the business are explainable, resilient, secure, and scalable? Have there been any material disruptions or security breaches, and how were they solved? Is the ownership of the IT and IP clearly in the hands of the entity being purchased, and not, for example, owned by an affiliate or by partners of the business or employees or founders? Was open source code used to develop the software and if so, should a software auditing services company be engaged? Cybersecurity and privacy will also be a key area of diligence. How can the buyer attempt to structure solutions to diligence issues that may be raised? An asset purchase, as opposed to a stock deal or a merger, may allow the buyer to leave liability issues behind. If the buy now, pay later is selling in a competitive auction, though, an asset deal may not be on the cards. In public deals, there will typically be no recourse against the seller or the target after closing. Even in private deals, many are now providing no recourse or very low recourse, such that the seller's indemnity obligation may be little or none, other than perhaps for fundamental rep and fraud narrowly defined. In this situation, the buyer can purchase rep and warranty insurance, but should be very careful that the key risks are in fact covered. For example, many insurers carve out cybersecurity and consumer regulatory issues. It is possible to get coverage for regulatory and compliance representations, but of course known problems will not be covered. Insurers also tend to look at the buyer's due diligence work and attempt to carve out any issues raised in a more general way. These coverage issues should be negotiated to ensure that the coverage is worthwhile. For a particularly egregious regulatory issue, the buyer may be able to get a special indemnity from the seller, but that can be quite difficult to obtain. Sellers are well advised to do their own reverse due diligence on regulatory compliance matters so that buyer's discovery of a serious issue late in the process does not make it necessary for the seller to agree to a special indemnity. Ultimately, buyers will need to assess the materiality of regulatory compliance and other risks and price them into its valuation of the target. As described, buy now, pay later transactions can be complex to navigate, but with good preparation and counsel should allow the buyer to close a successful transaction. This brings our call to an end. Thank you for tuning in. A few brief reminders. You will receive an email with a link to the recording of today's call, and it will also be available as a podcast. Lastly, if you have any questions related to today's content, please email them to gfm at mayorbrown.com. Thank you again. You may now all disconnect.